For those of you who don't know me, my name is David. I'm one of the pastors here. I pastor over at the South Pasadena campus, and we have just had an amazing time uh, so far this summer. I hope you've been having a good summer. My wife and I just got back from Mosaic, uh, Mexico. We were with our community in Mexico City, and it was such a beautiful time. And I was, I was talking to them there about my experience in Mexico City. See, when I was 24 years old in 1994, I was uh, needing to get a job uh, in education and be bilingual. But I didn't know enough Spanish to fake it, so I had to go to Mexico for two summers to learn Spanish. So I, I lived there, and I remember just having this incredible time. I met this family and just really just fell in love with the people there. And, and I, I remember even there just learning to, uh, to pray and to fast. And I was praying for you, actually. 30 years ago when I was a kid, I was, I was praying for uh, us as a, a community to be a church for the outsider, for people who didn't fit in a normal church. Yes, I know, I'm telling you, you don't fit in a normal church, yeah. Um, but for the crazies, you know, for people who rejected religion but embraced God in their life. Does that make sense? I was praying that we would actually make sense for the rest of the world so that people could get a hold of Jesus and understand what he was saying and what his life was about. And, and something happened as I was praying. I'll never forget those, those summers because as I was praying for Los Angeles, I fell in love with the people in Mexico City. I started praying for the people in Mexico as well. I prayed for a great movimiento de fe, a great movement of faith to take place there. And I told him last week when I was speaking for the very first time there at Mosaic in Mexico City, I said, you know, I am standing in an answer prayer. I'm, I'm watching this, and I, I can't believe how God has brought so many. And I had no idea that I would not just be witnessing a movement of faith, but I would actually be part of it. I had no idea that that would be taking place. And now a week later, I'm standing here in Hollywood, and I'm looking at all of you beautiful people. And I can tell you, it's the same. See, I am standing here in a, as a manifestation of a whispered prayer from, from a kid. And it's, it's incredible. And in fact, if I could go back in time, I would go back and I would tell that kid, hey, did you know your best days are coming? Your best days are coming. You're not going to believe what's going to happen in 30 years, kid. You, you, you won't be able to imagine that how many people will let go of depression and anxiety and find life in Jesus. You won't be able to fathom how many people decide not to commit suicide and instead to get a hold of who God is and to be, bring hope to people as they hear their story. You're not going to believe what it's going to be like in 30 years to see people be, move from L.A. to all over the world and bring faith and hope and love to people that do not have it because they have found their life in Jesus. You can't imagine what will take place all over the world. I'd love to shake that kid. Tell him your best days are coming. Your best days are coming. Your best days are coming. You believe that this morning? Yeah. You may be here and you may be thinking, man, yeah, I, I want to believe that. I want to believe that, but I'm stuck inside of a life I'm not sure how to get out of. I want to believe that, but I'm stuck in a relationship and stuck in a career. And I don't, I don't know exactly how to climb out of it. I'm really in this moment in life. And I, don't, I can't imagine that my life could get through this right now. It just feels like I'm here forever, you know? You know what I'm talking about? When you're in the struggle, you're in the thing. You don't know if you're actually ever going to get out of it. Or... Maybe you're having a fantastic time of life. You're like, no, 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 it's, it's the opposite, man. I can't imagine things being better. I'm having the time of my life. I have great relationships. I live in a great place. I have great friends, and the food is amazing right now. <laughs> like, you, you can't imagine better days than this, and yet you may have this creeping feeling that, oh, no. 
it's only going to get worse from here. <laughs> like, I'm having a great time, but I mean, it, if it doesn't get better, then all it's going to get is worse. And that might haunt you a little bit, and maybe you're like, thanks for reminding me of that. This morning, I don't know what it is. I just want to let you know that your best days are coming. And I want to talk about that today because the caveat is your best days may be coming, but you might not recognize them. Your best days might be coming, but you might be so distracted. You might be passing by them because you're not in tune. Your best days are coming, but you might lose sight not have the courage to step into those days that were designed just for you. And fortunately, the ancients wrote things down for us so that we could unwrap how do we not miss our best days. And I want to talk to you today from Proverbs chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, as we look at our future. It says in verse 1, to humans belong the plans of the heart. But from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. All of a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. First thing in this verse that stands out is that the, there's a proper answer. I mean, I'm making my plans in my heart. How about you? I mean, I plan to... To be here at Mosaic and to, to lead here and to be part of this with my friends. And I plan to, my, my, my daughter just graduated from high school. We're sending her to college. So I'm planning to use every ounce of discretionary funds to send her to college. You know, I'm planning to keep my house and my car in great condition for at least 100 years. You know, I'm making all these plans in my heart. And the list goes on and on. How about you? But there's a proper answer. What's the question exactly? Well, maybe that's the whole thing. Is that maybe we're bringing God our plans and we're not asking him his plans. Maybe we're, we're bringing him everything we want to do and we're not asking him what he actually sees. And so maybe there's some questions that can unwrap for us this idea of a future that he actually imagines for us. If we're going to step into our best days ahead, you're going to have to ask God what your future is. Ask God what your future is. I know. I, I think I know. I think we think we know, right? But there's a reply you will never know unless you ask. A reply, something that God has designed for you, but if you don't ask, I mean, I have this, this really bad idea that came into my mind. I don't know how it got there, but at the end of my life, I have this mental picture that at the end, there's going to be like a giant screen kind of like this, and a bunch of people kind of like you looking at my entire life, both the good and the bad. I'm going to feel pretty naked. You're going to see everything, right? But what's even worse to add insult to injury, it's not just all the things I did in my life, good and bad. It's all the things I could have done in my life. All the possible futures. I had the talent. I had the ability. I just didn't see it because I never asked. The greatest future we can have doesn't just take planning. It takes asking. Asking God what his future is. I have this planner's prayer I can give you. Here it is. God, may the plans on your lips match the plans on mine. If you don't know, maybe begin to ask those questions. What is my future? I remember I was, I had a, an awakening in college. I, I woke up, I, I had a spiritual awakening, I'll call it, right? Crashed into God and I just wanted to like, oh wow, there's more here, wow. I remember just saying, God, I mean, if you have a plan for like my summer, I'd love to know what it is. In fact, I want to do really exactly what you want me to do, not kind of what you want me to do. I mean, there's a difference, right? Like, a, I was, like, really anal about this. No, 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 exactly what you imagine me doing, I want to do, you know, and stuff. And that bothered my parents because they wanted me to work and make money. <laughs> so 
I, I, I was praying, I was asking him, and I'll, I'll tell you, in that moment, I had something that happened to me that hadn't happened before or since. I had a vision. And if a vision was like a, a, like a deep knowing in an instant what I was supposed to do, that's what happened to me. And I heard not an audible voice, just a, a, a knowing that uh, God had said, you're going to meet a man, and he's going to be a visionary who works with the cities, and you're going to put your life under his. That's all I knew. So I finished the prayer, and I thought, either I just had a bad burrito, or God had an encounter with me, and I, I, like, I'm supposed to meet this man. I didn't know exactly how to meet the man. I didn't know what to do, and how do you, like, Put it out there, looking for man, visionary, work for the cities, you know, contact this number. You know, I had no idea how to find that, but I just figured if it's from God, it's just it's going to happen. So I just went around in my life and crashed into Erwin McManus, who was a visionary who worked with the cities, and I knew what to do. And so ended up working with him. You know, I thought for three months, 30 years later, God was designing this for me, which is incredible because what it tells me is, see, I was only asking for three months, and he gave me 30 years. <laughs> Isn't it crazy that God always gives us more than we expect? You see, God is always trying to give you more, and the reason that we don't ask the question is because we think he wants to give us less. He wants to do less. He wants to give us a, 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 a lot less than we have expected, what we hope for us. We actually think what we hope for us is greater than what he hopes for us. And it's the opposite. It's always more and it's always dangerous. I mean, can you imagine God's perspective when we have these big plans and he, we tell him our big plans? You know, it's really a risk for us. It's like God's up there and we're just praying, God, I want to buy a house. In Los Angeles, you know, like, I'm going to have a big career, you know, like whatever it is, you know, we're kind of mousy, right? But he's God, you know, he's listening like, God, I really want to get married someday with a millionaire or whatever, you know. <laughs> and what's God going to do? He's just like, go for it. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, go ahead and do it. Like, you know, it's just not that surprising. <laughs> it's not that big, you know, it's just like we think it's so large and yet God is like, if you only knew what I have in store for you. I'm not talking about shaping 70 years. I'm talking about shaping eternity. I have a plan that's going to last a thousand years for you. It's always more. It's always bigger. It will always cost you everything. I have this friend of mine, Doug. He used to work here, actually, in production, my favorite team. And he would load the trucks when we were doing stuff, and he's just an incredible guy. And he moves to Texas and ends up working for SAPD, you know, as a policeman. And the first year, like, he are staying in touch, and he's like, hey, I, uh, I just need, what, would love for you to pray for me. I'm having some struggles at work. Well, like, Doug was a, like a, he was like a monster. Like, Doug was like, the, the real deal, like super courageous, super, you know, talented. He's just like no body fat, irritating, you know, like that. <laughs> so Doug was like, hey, I need you to pray for, I need you to pray for me. <laughs> and, so, and so I pray for him. You know, I was like, God, you know Doug. <laughs> I pray that this is the hardest year he has ever had. <laughs> I pray that the challenges are so difficult for him that he's got a weep on his knees and cry out to you because Doug I pray that God you would pull out the greatness inside of him and would have so much conflict and so much controversy and so much challenge that it would actually create this incredible life God give that to Doug as a gift amen <laughs> and he texts back thanks bro <laughs> we're not friends anymore but but I pray that for you. I pray that your life is challenging. I pray that the great things that cause you to pray to him will ignite this relationship where, yes, in desperation you understand and he's proven himself to you in challenge. 
because then you'll meet yourself. (laughs) And you'll get close to what he sees in you. But you got to start with a question. you got to ask God what your future is. And maybe if you're not, you don't have the courage to do that, just ask God, hey, God, do my plans represent my greatest future? Maybe start there as a warm-up so you can build your courage. Are you asking God what your future is? But what if God has great plans for me, but it's something I don't want? Like, great, you got great plans. Just they're not my plans. Well, Proverbs 16.2 says, All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. If you want to step into your best days, you can't just ask God what your future is. You have to ask God what your motives are. And I love that it says weighed by the Lord. How many of you have a scale that you hate? Okay, one. Okay, I do, I do too. Um, you know, a scale, you go to it and you're expecting, I mean, you haven't had carbs for three months. And you step on the scale in the morning thinking, okay, baby, tell me something I love. And... You're expecting, like, kindness, but what you get is insults. You get insults. You think, the thing is broken. I don't know. When you pick it up and you look at it, like, it's got to be, you know, you start messing with it. You just, okay, it's complicated. It's a complicated relationship with the scale, right? So you know what my worst scale is? It's the scale at the doctor's office, right? I mean, you're there. It's public. The nurse is there standing right next to you. You're taking it, whatever. And it's just like, she keeps on, you know, adding more. Oh, no, we got to go to another section. Now here, here's a little, you know, no, no. And you're like embarrassed, but you're there. And then she's just like, yeah. And she look at the weight, and it's like 10 pounds heavier. Sorry. Calm down. It's 10 pounds heavier. And, uh, you know, I always make a, make a light joke. And it's like, oh, you know, clothes add 10 pounds, right? And she has no sense of humor. She's like, it's like half a pound. I hate that scale. I hate that nurse. And so it's the same way. I don't hate the nurse. I'm kidding. It's the same way with our motives. Like we actually believe that our motives are pure. Like, I believe psychologically that I weigh that much. I really believe that the scale is off in the doctor's office. I just erase it. It's another, you know, marker in my life. I don't even pay attention to that, that scale. You know, like, I, I just, I, it seems like this off, right? But our seamer is off. It's like we don't realize. We, we, we think that our hearts are pure. That everything we're doing is from a pure heart, and we tell everybody... <laughs> It's just, what's wrong with you, bro? Why are you, you know, like, I'm good. Yeah, but, but the scripture actually says in Jeremiah that the heart is deceitfully wicked. When the psalmist prays, he says, search me and know me. See if there's any wicked way in me. Wicked way in me? When you interact with the scriptures, it says they will lay the secrets of the heart bare. There's secrets in there? Yes. Did you know that your heart holds secrets? That your heart actually conceals what's true? That your heart actually lies to you and tells you things that get you in trouble? Have you ever longed for something and gotten it and then regretted it? Good, yeah, okay, you're with me, you're with me, you know? Maybe it's a bike, you know, you just really wanted that bike and you just, you really got what you wanted and now you don't own the bike, the bike owns you. You're, you're paying for that bike. You're living for that bike or that car, or that boat or that house or that device, whatever it is. Or maybe it's a relationship. You really wanted that boyfriend. Oh, God, if I could just have the boyfriend, my whole life would be wonderful. And then God gives you the boyfriend. And now you have the boyfriend. <laughs> and like, God, if you could just get this boyfriend away from me. (laughs) Or maybe a girlfriend, you know, maybe whatever it is, that relationship that you long for, you can't wait to get out and get away from. That, That wasn't, you're not dealing with those consequences because 
You had bad planning. You're dealing with those consequences because you had bad motives. And you may not realize that. You see, your why was off before your what was off. And this is what God is trying to say, that our ways seem right to us, that our motives seem right to us, but are not right. Don't lead us into the future that we desire. This is the difference. Jesus says that you're going to need him and his people to help you not just to know his heart, but to know your heart. Isn't that crazy? Like, what does that say about independence? How can, I, how can I make any decision by myself? Yeah, dummy, you're not supposed to make it by yourself. You actually are supposed to have counsel and people that love you and tell you the truth so many times that I have been going the wrong direction, thinking I'm going the right direction for the right reason, and my team's like, nope, David, that's not really a good, wise decision. You come, come this way. I'm like, really? Yes, yeah, just trust us. Okay. And I, I move, and I've been rescued so many times by this community, by my leaders and my friends who told me, that's just, you're just off, bro. You're off. You know? But that's, that's a gift. That's a gift that we have. And your motives are so important. It's just, so how do you build that scale? How do you tell what your motives are as you interact? In James 4, 8, it says, Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Your loyalty. It says, if you don't purify your hearts, your loyalty actually is divided. And when your loyalty is divided, things go backwards. You don't, you don't move like this in your life. You move like this in your life. And you move much slower to the life that God has designed for you. And something that I don't know about, about you, but there's time that even, not just as my heart like leads me astray, but my heart condemns me. My heart beats me up, shames me, tells me all the things over and over and over again. 70% of what we're telling ourselves is negative, right? But it's not even new negative stuff. Like, it might be creative and entertaining if it's constantly new negative stuff, but it's always the same stuff. It's like just like two or three things a day, over and over and over, 70 times a day. You know what I'm saying? Anybody? Is it just me? Like, it's constant negative, right? It's just shaming. Have you ever been so overwhelmed that you're like, I'm just exhausted, like my heart constantly... Is beating me up. And if I just keep believing what my heart is saying about me, I don't have much hope. But the scripture says that God is greater than your heart. In fact, it says when your heart condemns you, that God is greater than your heart. And there's so many times I've just said, God, I don't trust my heart. I trust you. And that God can actually straighten me out. He can help me understand. Don't listen to your heart. He's not your friend. Listen to me. And I will guide you through your heart. You may not feel it. But if you follow me, I will lead you into paths from your passion rather than your mood. Rather than your desire. And your passion and what drives you. Your passion is who you actually long to become. And if I live for my passion, not my mood. My passion, not my desire. My passion, not my feels. If I lead and live in that, even when I don't feel it, I will be granted life. And God will be the Lord of my heart. And I won't be divided. There's a question I ask myself, it's a good question for you to build a scale for your heart. One is, do you want God to please you or do you want to please God? It's a good test to ask yourself that. It's a simple question. Number two, do you want to be closer to your future or do you want to be closer to God in your future? Two completely directions different directions. 
If you actually long to be closer to God in your future, you are destined and your best days are coming. But if you just want to be closer to your future, you'll get that too. You just won't get satisfaction or meaning. The one who deserves your heart is the one who loves you the most. Isn't that true? It's us living life long enough to see who actually loves us the most that we give our heart to. I wish my teenage daughter knew that, but I don't. That's a whole other talk we're not going to get into. You see, lean in with God and bring your questions to him in the scriptures, and you'll begin to understand that he loves you so desperately that he has this, this design for you and that his design will always bring you freedom and life and fulfillment. But the greatest future you can live is dependent on your why, not your what. You can trust him with your future, but what if it's not, that's not the problem. Like, what if you look at him and say, like, great, there's a great future for you. And you say, yeah, I believe that there's a great future for me. I believe that God has that for me. I'm, I, I give him my heart, but I, I, it's not that I don't trust God. I don't trust me. I don't have the strength to keep stepping into that future. I don't know how to get that courage to not miss my moment. I'm trying to do everything I can to, to follow God, but I don't know exactly how to do it because of me, <laughs> the one person that it's always there. Doesn't leave me alone. Finds his way to me and just like trips me up. How do I actually find my future if I'm the biggest obstacle? And the scripture speaks to that. He talks about in verse 3. It says, commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans. It's not enough to just ask God what your future is or ask God what your motives are. You must ask God to take control of your future. Ask God to take control of your future. And he will establish your plans, it says. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. It's interesting. The word establish comes from the root word stabilis, which is to stabilize. He will stabilize your plans. Now, I got a chance to work on my backyard in 2020 during the pandemic, and I worked with the contractors and the crew to, to build a, a thing that was overhanging in our backyard. And when I say I worked with them, I just means like I brought them water, <laughs> and they did all the work, and then, you know, I just let them in, you know, anyway. Um, and so as they were building it, one thing I realized is like they had to like, they had to jackhammer and dig deep to go high. And the, the higher that we needed, the deeper they needed to dig, and they had to dig through all this rock, and this is this idea of stabilizing. Maybe one of the problems that we have is we're just like, we have, we have our plans like a post, and we just put them there, and like, this, these are my plans, and then, you know, they just fall down. Each, here's my plans, and they just keep falling down. Here's what I plan to do, and it doesn't work out for you, and it doesn't work out for me, because they're shaky plans. Because it has no foundation. There's nothing in your private world that has changed for your public world to have stability. And your private world is the whole thing. It's who you are when no one's looking. It's who you are with you and God, like getting to the deep stuff. We don't want to get past the surface. And we wonder why our plans keep failing. And are not stable and are not established by him. Because he keeps on trying to take us deep, but we run for the hills when things come up. We don't know how to build that world. And this is what he's trying to say. He's saying, don't commit to their plans. Commit to me and make your plans. Does that make sense? I think this is the difference. It's nuance. Can you hear the difference? It's just nuance. I thought I just need to be more committed. No, no, no. Commit to me. God doesn't call you to great plans. He calls you to himself, and then you plan, and then you move, and then you step into your future. Why do you need God in your future? 
The future that God has for you is too heavy for you to hold. That's why you need him in your future. Because he's going to be holding you up as you're holding your future. This is what's beautiful about who God is and what he's given to you, what he's prepared for you. You have to give God control of your future. So, several years ago, gosh, 16 years ago, uh, we lost my, my wife's parents at sea for three days with the Sea of Cortez. They weren't fishermen. They weren't used to being on the sea. They were actually pastors, and they were building a children's village in Zambia, Africa. They were salt of the earth people, wonderful, beautiful people. But they were lost at sea for three days in Baja. And we were driving down, and we, we discovered this. And they, they told them that the, a hurricane had hit. They had closed the ports, and they were gone. They'd last seen them take their boat out, and, and everyone thought they're dead. And so we didn't exactly know what to do. We ended up praying. We contacted our community. And within an hour, 150 people from around the world were praying that they would have survived it. And it was just, it was a, it was a very, very hard time for our family. And so I was, I was there. And we put together a search and rescue party. And in the morning, we we're going to go out and look for them. They were finally going to open the ports in the morning. We we're going to go look for my, my in-laws. And, I remember, honestly, I woke up with hope. I had, was optimistic. I thought, we're going to find them on some island around here. 7 a.m., and I went out. And 7 a.m. turned to 8, turned to 9, turned to 10, 11, and 12. And the officer said, we need to go back because they're going to have to close the ports again because the storm is coming back, and you have to, it's going to be too dangerous to be out here. And we're, we're going back, and I just remember thinking, God, I... I can't fail here. Like, I can't tell my wife that we did not find her parents. I can't tell my wife that her parents are dead. And you know, when you're in that level of desperation, your prayers are not logical. Like, they don't make any sense. You, you throw logic out and you just cry out to God, listen. You listened. I don't know how this works. I just know that I have not found my parents, and you know where my parents are. So if they are, like, at the bottom of the sea or they're dead somewhere, nobody knows right now. So you could actually change things. You could rearrange things. You could make them alive. You could cause this whole thing to just go away, and nobody would know, and we would be so grateful. What do you want? And I just had this moment. I was just asking God, well, what do you want from me? What, what can I negotiate with? I have, I have nothing. I, what, can I, what can I give you to make this happen? What's our, let's make a deal here. And immediately what came to my mind was, David, give me your future. Give me your give you my future. I work for Mosaic. Like, like, I'm giving you my future. I mean, David, give me your future. God, I, I, everything I have is yours, David. Give me your future. I just said, okay, God. Everything I have, everything that I think I'm going to do with my life, every plan that I've ever had, everything is yours. It's in your hands. It's in your hands. I give it to you. I don't care what has to happen to me anymore. Help us. And it was, it was 10 minutes later that we found my parents on an island, hungry and alive. But it was six months later when I received a phone call from my wife that was shocking. She said, I'm pregnant. And see, we had finished having children. We had cars for two kids, house for two kids, neighborhood for two kids, school for We figured our life was two kids, we're done. And we 
arranged it that way. And then God gives us a surprise, a miracle. I call my mom. I'm so excited. And then I tell her about it. And she says, son, do you remember you gave God your future six months ago and he gave you a son? You see, I thought that me giving God my future meant, I don't know, I was going to be crippled. <laughs> or I was going to be sent somewhere miserable to serve him for the rest of my days. I know, I'm, I go dark. <laughs> and God, God gave me 10,000 moments of joy because he gave me a son. Everything God wants for you is always more. It's always better. It will always cost you everything. But in the end, you will stand in miracle. And you will look back on 30 years and think, I couldn't have dreamt this up. I'm alive and I'm living. If you trust him with your heart, because he loves you more than anyone else, he's the one that knows what to do with your heart. If you trust him with your heart, well, your best days are coming. Your best days are coming. Your best days are coming. Let's pray together. You'll be here and you, you feel the weight of your own future and your own plans and it's crushing you and you didn't know that he could take and change everything for you. He didn't know he could transform you and give you life and freedom. He didn't know that it's so much better than you could have imagined. But today you know. Now you understand that he's come to give you life. That he died over 2,000 years ago so that everything that would stop you would lose its power for you to live great on this earth. The God that comes for you, his name is Jesus, and he earns your life. But he will never steal it or take it without your permission. You can have all of him with one simple prayer, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. It's not all you and God have to talk about, but it's a start of a relationship where you enter into this future with him. Jesus, I give you my life. If you prayed that prayer just now, I want you to raise your hand so I can pray for you. Right now, all around the room, raise them high so I can see. This is your moment to step in. Anyone else, don't let this moment pass you by. When you are passing by the moments for your very future, don't let yourself hold on to the past, hold on to the pain. Let go and let God change everything. You cannot do it on your own. You are not strong enough. This is why it takes his presence and power in your life. Beautiful. Jesus, I pray for those who've decided to give their lives to you for the very first time. I pray, Father, that you would give them the power and the authority to step in. You would fill them with your presence, God, that you would help them have the wisdom to know that they cannot do it alone. And even with you, that you put them in this community to walk with people so they can teach them how to live free, that they would not just do the comfortable or the familiar, that they would sacrifice and step into the awkwardness of living with other people who are for them, God. I pray, Father, you would expand our vision and our faith here. May you build such a movement that other people will come and say, what's going on in that place? There's life here. I want this. It's so beautiful, God. I pray this on them. I thank you, God, for not leaving us behind, for giving us a hope and a future. Thank you for your love and your life. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Will you join me in thanking God for the beautiful lives that are happening here? It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, God. What a beautiful Sunday we had had so far. Um, we just don't want to move from this moment. There is people's lives that have been changed and transformed, and we don't want to take this moment lightly or for granted. So I'm just going to ask you, give, give us a couple more minutes. Don't move from your seat yet. Don't move yet. We're not done. There's a lot of people. We saw so many hands that were raised, and they were doing what God is asking them, just to trust them and to be obedient and give their lives to Jesus. So if you were one of those who raised your hand, we want to say that you don't have to do this alone. We're here for you to walk you through this um, new season in your life. And I love that people are just trusting God this morning. There is like a beautiful thing happen. And we have a gift for you. If you don't want to take it, I will say you should take it. Because we have for you is the Bible. Okay? Our pastor David was saying, you, we need to ask God, what is the future that he has for us? And guess what? This Bible is the best book you can have in your house. And this Bible will help you to know what are God's intentions for your life and to know your purpose and to find out what's your future. So take the Bible, go to the back, say hi to someone, and also just share what you did today. Share with someone that you love because this is a life changing moment for you and I hope that you don't forget this day um the other thing that I want to talk to you guys is that everything that we do here at Mosaic doesn't happen by accident it happens because there is a lot of people who have been giving in your behalf pastor David was saying 30 years right I keep thinking 30 years there have been people who have given sacrificially and super obedient 30 years ago, so you today, in 2024, you can find a place where you can find faith, love, and hope. And you can find community so you don't have to do this alone. And you can find Jesus. And I love that we get to um, be part in my family, our family. We have three kids and we get to teach them that it's not just about us. It's not about us. It's about people. We're changing. We're doing beautiful things here at Mosaic. We're changing the world. And when we give, we change. We expand. We move forward. And we change from the inside out. So I just want to encourage you to give with us today. If you're someone who gives here, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being obedient. There's people who give their 10%. It's called the tithing. And they have been moving forward with us. If you have the ability of create wealth and you feel like God is calling you to more and to elevate your giving, this is the moment. Today is the day to do that. And if you have never given us or given with us before, I just want to ask you, we have, there is a envelope on your seat. Can you take it? It says, Gener generosity changes you. Take this with you. Pray. Pastor David was saying, ask God. So I just want to encourage you to take this with you today. Ask God what is what he wants to give you. Because when we trust you, he changes us. And he moves us forward. So I just want to invite you to do that as they pass the buckets. And as we talk, I'm just going to give you a second for this moment to give.